abundance of the fruits of the earth, and then for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, God, have mercy. For those who travel by land and by sea, or by air, for the sick and the suffering, for captives and for their deliverance, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our own deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, or necessity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Now, Lord, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. All in remembrance are most holy, most pure, most blessed and glorious lady, Theotokos, and ever virgin, every of all the saints, and let us commit ourselves and each other and our whole
Prince, Wisdom, the Prokimenon is in the first soul. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, as we have set our hope on thee. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, as we have set our hope on thee. As we have set our hope on thee. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. Praise befits the just. Died and was buried. 
and being in torment in Hades, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham at a distance and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your blessings, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between you and us, there is a fixed, a great chasm that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced the one may rise from the dead. Bibles, but that's very 
Uh, it's up to us to name it. It's called the parable of the shrewd manager. Does that sound familiar? If not, it's because it's a, it's a, a difficult parable. It's, it's, like a, it's a strange story. Remember the story? It's someone who works for his boss, to make it a little bit more modern. And he, the boss says, you're fired, basically. But before he's really fired, he spends his, his few hours or days um, to go see his boss's uh, debtors who owe money to, to the company, and he writes off some of the debt to make them happy, to make friends with those people. Then when he gets really fired, well, he's made friends with people that owe money to his boss, and now they owe less. And it seems like it's dishonest. And yet, in verse 8, the master, the boss, commended the dishonest manager because he had, he had acted shrewdly for the people of this world or this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, that's the advice to us from the Lord, use worldly wealth to date friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone and you're dead or you're poor, you will be welcomed into your heavenly or eternal dwellings. And then verse 10. For whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. But whoever is dishonest with even little or incompetent, I think is the same word there, will be dishonest or incapable with much. So that's the context how we get to the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Then it's applied to the Pharisees. Next verse, almost 14. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and they were sneering at Jesus. Sneering at Jesus. You can see sometimes the faces. So he told them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is or may be detestable in God's sight. See, the Pharisees had been entrusted with so very much. They had the law and the prophets. They actually knew how to read it. They had the scrolls. They had an office of respect, of teaching, of some position, some honor, some influence. But they used this deposit from God not to serve God, but to serve themselves, <coughs> to increase their power, their influence. And so now comes as a second, a second hit of the Lord to drive this point is the same principle with the story of the rich man unnamed. Who has no name? God doesn't know him. I never knew you. What's your name? You have no name. Kind of the way Napoleon. <laughs> Napoleon uh, was honored, if you can believe it, this year. It was 200 years, Napoleon. And then you look at his record, it's absolutely uh, terrifying in so many ways, right? The wars, the soldiers killed, and how he ends uh, captive of the British on an island, and he's buried, and it says, here lies. No name. Not worthy of a name. That's the rich man in the eyes of God. And he was entrusted with a lot. Not everyone was rich in those, in those days. Not everyone was a Jew in those days who had received the law and the prophets and the sons of the covenant and the hope of Messiah. He had received so much. He had even received the knowledge that Abraham is his father. You see, him call Abraham father. And then he had another thing in trust, so to speak, right? another thing in his, uh, in his deposit, and it was that one beggar on his gate. Equally given to him by God, who gave him riches, life, breath, the law, the prophets, 
covenant and his brother, his brother Lazarus at the gate. And I think we have to realize, however painful it is, that we today are probably richer than the rich man. In some ways, we live better in America. And we have received a lot more spiritually, theologically. We've received an incredible, unbelievable treasure. And perhaps we've been entrusted with a Lazarus somewhere in our life, either yesterday or today or tomorrow, who is part of that, of that responsibility, of that gift of God to us for our salvation, to serve Him. And of course, it was easy for the rich man, as it is for us, to not notice, refuse to notice Lazarus. There were many excuses that we can find. Lazarus maybe was cursed by God. After all, the dogs came to lick his sores. He was afflicted, punished by God. He must be a sinner. That's an excuse not to do anything. Or maybe Lazarus, being alive today at the gate, will be there tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow we'll do something for Lazarus. Or thirdly, well, Lazarus is alive at the gate. Maybe someone else is taking care of Lazarus. He seems to be still breathing. Many, many excuses. We have not to do what is right. And it's such a theme in the New Testament, it really hit me, um, that God does not like people who make excuses. In the Gospel, I cannot come to the wedding or the banquet. Right? Excuses. Or, well, you were late, Lord, and therefore uh, I just kind of forgot about you and I began doing my own thing. So I was afraid of you, therefore I did nothing. I did not see you, God, therefore I didn't know you really were around. And how many times did St. Paul drives it home in Romans 1, therefore we are without excuse. So, the rich man who received so much, unlike the shrewd steward of the first parable, was not shrewd or wise or clever and made no heavenly friends with his earthly riches. When, in the context, it seems that so little was requested. What did the rich, the, the rich man have to give to Lazarus to kind of fulfill something? The, the, the Lazarus wanted his crumbs from the rich man's table, stuff that wasn't even needed. He didn't want the clothing, the house, a pension. But was truly superfluous. The same in the parable again in Luke of the prodigal son who wanted to eat the, the pods, the food that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. Those were not valuable things. Nobody had to, to lose their shirt to do this act of mercy. And this teaching now was placed upon us right? to be wise, to be shrewd, to be intelligent, to be mindful. That death may come, no, death will come. And we have friends in the eternal heavenly mansions. Because when comes this moment of we die, then there are no excuses, only, only justice. It's in the scriptures in Hebrews, that little book meant to kind of uh, make us scared to read Hebrews again, uh, verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed for everyone to die once, then comes the judgment. There's no reincarnation anywhere in the New Testament or in the Old as well. We live, we die, then comes justice, the judgment. There's such a wonderful book that just came out, I'll do, I'll do, me, do some promotion for it, uh, uh, by Father Stephen de Young. You know, sometimes we can be proud. We have some wonderful, wonderful teachers in our in our church. Uh, and he wrote one a wonderful book called "The Religion of the Apostles," 
worth, uh, worth reading about the Catechism, really powerful, what the Apostles believed, or what Jesus believed. And a book came out this week, which was on a topic that always bothered me, and maybe bothered you sometimes, and it's called, God is a Man of War. And it's about violence in the Old Testament. It's terrific. Before it's great. And he writes about divine justice. And he says, justice conveys a realm of space and time where all things exist in their proper place and relationship to one another. Now that was not the case between the rich man and Lazarus. That was not a proper place, proper relationship at all. And one can be, you know, more intelligent and be richer, but one cannot be at his gates completely full of sores and, and abandoned. And then comes the judgment. It's when God restores justice, the correct order, the harmony of creation. So Christ will make it right. And when we use that sentence about St. Innocent two weeks ago, Christ will make it right. But in the meantime, we have to do what is right. I mean, to be orthodox means to do, really to do the right thing. To do what is right that glorifies God. That's our mission. What have we been entrusted with by God? A lot. A lot. In this day and age. What, how are we stewards of these things to foster Justice in, in, in the biblical sense, in the biblical sense, justice. Are we making heavenly friends, at least every once in a while? Are we maintaining the friendship we have with our heavenly friends? How do we relate with the living and the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? There's so much to bring home from this warning, from this parable. God may send us this very day or tomorrow something like that, kind of a Lazarus situation. Even in a parish, you know, we have to watch out that there may not be any, any Lazarus in the parish. That cannot be. This morning there was a, a poor, poor man at the church, literally at the city, you know, and when asked, well, do you, go to a church to receive help, care, support. He was surprised at that concept, frankly. That he could go to a church somewhere, hopefully the church, you know, to receive some kind of, 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 you know, of a hot drink for goodness sake. So that is our task in, in, in an age of uh, falling darkness, where the gospel must shine even more brightly. Almost done. Um, how we relate with death is really important. Death comes to us, perhaps, you know, not when we really are prepared at all. Every day, and in this country, people die truly unexpectedly. So how we relate with death as Christians is very important. We can't take it lightly. Because we are to die, then comes the judgment. There's a, a, a saying of Jesus that was kept by the apostles later, but not in the New Testament, but which I believe is true. And they said that he said, in the state that I find you, I will judge you. I think it's very biblical. Very biblical. Will we be found doing God's work or not? I think the world out there is unable to relate with death with sanity. It can become worse. Now, I'm no fan of Halloween, if I'm trying to do this, and of uh, the Dia de los Muertos, whatever that is, you know, this, this Mexican death cult that, that has become. And you see, you know, skulls everywhere. It's like, where do you go? People have skulls tattooed on them these days, on their t shirts. What? Do they relate with death rightly? I don't think so. We Christians recognize that death is a time of judgment. Death, our last enemy, shall be conquered. We take that encounter with God, that last breath, seriously. And we be found doing the Lord's work. 
Well, I was going to read to you a long passage, but uh, I'm out of my God-given time, almost. Now, I came across this wonderful text, but you can read the whole thing at home. It's a letter by an early Christian named Aristides, a Greek name, to the emperor. The year is about 150, so very early, and he's trying to explain to the emperor why people are becoming Christians. What are these Christians about? And it's just amazing. I'll email it to you to spare you the whole thing. It's that good. About what it means to be a Christian. And whenever one of their poor passes from the world, each one of them, according to his ability, gives heed to him and carefully sees to his burial. If they're here, then one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of Messiah, all of them anxiously minister to his needs. If it is possible to redeem him, to ransom him, they will collect and set him free. It's not about those captives in Haiti. People that were, you know, that were abducted for ransom, they were Christians. If any among them that is poor or needy, if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy the lack of food. He, believe this. he could write this to the king with a straight face. That's the way Christians lived. They observed the precepts of their Messiah with so much care, living justly and soberly as the Lord their God commanded them. May this be the engraving on our tomb. And God give us grace and strength to accomplish His holy will now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. Let us sing with our whole soul and our whole mind. Let us sing. Lord Almighty, the God of our fathers, we pray that hear us and have mercy. Lord have mercy. Have mercy on us, O God, according to thy great goodness, we pray that hear us and have mercy.
rightly divide the word of truth, especially the hearts which of Benjamin. And all our presbyters and deacons in Christ, and also those who are to see and labor for us in the holy monastic orders, and may the Lord our God remember in his heavenly kingdom the president of our country and all our civil authorities and the armed forces, guiding them to accomplish what is good and restraining what is evil. And may the Lord our God remember. In his heavenly kingdom, those who hold me have special prayers and healing, visitation, especially for the priest Joseph, the priest Anthony, the monk Maxus, and those who have for the Hunter of Leone, for Monica, Virgil, Lorraine, Patrice, and all those who may be sick or ailing among us. And may the Lord our God remember all of you Orthodox Christians. It is heavenly kingdom always, now and ever, and to the ages of ages.
Let us stand with fear, let us be attentive, that we may offer the holy oblation.
grant the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts near offer and make this bread the precious body of thy Christ. And that which is in this cup the precious blood of thy Christ. Amen. Changing them by thy Holy Spirit.
We give thanks to the all invisible King who by his infinite power to create everything and the greatness of thy mercy to bring all things non existence into being. Look down to the heaven, O Master, upon those who have bowed their heads unto thee, awesome God, and thyself, O Master, receive these gifts, even offerings to all of us for good, according to the individual need of each of us. Trouble with those who travel by land, by sea, or by air. Heal the sick. Especially among us, O God, who art the physician of our souls and bodies, through the prayers and the compassion and love of mankind, for thy only begotten Son, with whom thou art blessed together, for thine all holy will and thy free spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen.
Always, now and forever. 
the awesome mysteries of Christ, let us warn the need. Give thanks to the Lord.
good to be to be here. Uh, we will have uh, uh, vespers on Tuesday at 6 p.m. So it's a beautiful service. It's short. Uh, there might be a short reflection after. So it's always worth uh, connecting with God on that Tuesday evening. And then, uh, uh, as usual, uh, services next weekend. Okay, um, any announcements as far as name days, birthdays, anniversaries, and things like that? Monica, you've been raising your hand for the whole time. It's whose birthday? I Mama, very good. Yes, Jesse. It was your birthday, that's what I said. Very true. Turn 12, and I'm my story. Yes? Okay, I just want to remind everyone that we're going to try to do the troubleshoot if it's not raining uh, for the kids next Sunday. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. I don't know what the plans are, but I want to make sure they're okay. But I will talk to you. Very good. Okay, anything else? Uh, any other uh, news announcements? Uh, we have donuts downstairs and coffee, so what else do we need to be happy after liturgy and some uh, coffee and donuts. Uh, and we welcome our visitors. Uh, uh, where are you visiting from, if I may ask you? Uh, Brookings, Oregon. Brookings, it's not that far. Okay, you live in Brookings? We do. Okay. We do the same part of the area now in Brookings. Okay, well it's good to have you here with us as uh, innocence. I know it's I know it's far, we have another Brookings uh, Brookings uh, family, so Eventually, there should be a church in Brookings, <laughs> at least a mission, so God will provide. But we can come and uh, bow down to the cross. Christ is in the midst. 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 Christ Christ is in our midst. Amen. Christ is in our midst. 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 Thank you. 